Thanks very much indeed, Margaret. Just to, to, to add my um, tribute to Medfash, which was uh, a charity set up in 1987, produced lots of uh, a very collaborative work with specialist societies, guidelines, um, testing in primary care, a whole range of things, which are through, through those, those, those years was were really influential. And I, I think that, that signals uh, what I want to talk about, which is, uh, and I'm sure there are many people here whose primary specialty is not sexual health or infectious diseases or, or HIV, but it, 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 whoever, whatever you're working in, it, you've got to fight, I think, for achieving change in the way your specialty improves the outcomes of care, and particularly where you are a specialty which has major interactions across other disciplines, including uh, that in, in community and in public health, where you're trying to screen for things, treat things, um, and in the case of HIV and, and some other conditions that we treat, looking at potentially life-threatening conditions, you've got you've to really try extra hard to influence at lots of levels to make change. And that, I hope, I'm going to illustrate for you really over the next 20 minutes. So let's just have a, a think of where we are, all right? Uh, maybe, um, I, don't, I won't sh ask for a show of hands, but you may have attended a sexual health clinic at some point, either as a student uh, or, a, or, or in, 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 a, in a professional private capacity, all right? If you have, Hopefully, they're not in the treble basement. They don't have sewage leaking. They're not on stilts in the car park, like the old one at the Prade Street Clinic. Uh, that they've, they've really come forward, often at the front of hospitals, or increasingly moved out of uh, settings around hospitals. Now, that's something that's happened really over the last 10 to 15 years, but it wasn't a new idea. In fact, 103 years ago, the Royal Commission on venereal disease, uh, met for quite a long time. They had 85 meetings, which I think rivals even one of the Brexit subcommittees, 22,000 questions, article in the Spectator, um, uh, pretty much uh, uh, denigrating the whole idea of talking about sex in public. Um, the role of science and data was, was prioritised. Um, the role of then the Parliament, the Venereal Diseases Act, was vital in setting up a venereal diseases surface, which basically said, and remember this is you know, a, a good 32 years before the origins of the NHS, that every local authority should have a clinic which is free, which is confidential, and which provides testing and treatment for venereal diseases. And part of this came out of the fact that much of the uh, evidence from the military at the, the onset of the First World War, was that there was real ill health due to uh, gonorrhea and syphilis amongst the troops. There was, um, in particular, a, a grounds uh, in the Act for there being surveillance. Now, times are different, or were different uh, then to they are now, and surveillance included a degree of enforcement and enforced screening, which, um, thankfully, was never really enacted. Now, what, when was all this happening? Well, it was happening around times like this. I mean, you can go to the Welcome Museum and see it. But this was a time when the Victorians uh, were making things like this to try and uh, prevent um, nighttime uh, um, interest in genitalia uh, by their, their children. Um, it, obviously, for Parliament, at a time which was born out of this type of, of attitudes towards sex, to have and pass, have a debate and pass a law on venereal diseases and to set up services was amazing. And we, re we celebrated its, it, the centenary of this uh, in Parliament um, um, three years ago. So another sort of heroine of this, Mari Stopes, all right? At the same time as this act was being passed, in order to write a book essentially about women's health and sex, including the enjoyment of sex, which was a quite radical idea in 1918, Mari Stopes had to call the book Married Love to get past the censor. Now, this is only 100 years ago, OK? So let's just put in perspective how far we've come and how those, both in medicine and in Parliament at that time, fought so hard to change values against a real countercurrent of, 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 of attitudes towards sex and a degree of prudishness. And Mari Stopes is, is clearly made massive impact uh, with, with her work, lifetime work. 
The next one I just want to say is, is the influence of the military. I know that they've got a stand outside. And, and um, um, Tommy Osmond uh, did a great deal of work to really influence through the, the, the 30s and then 40s, creating training courses. There weren't proper training courses for medical orderlies outside of the military in this time. A lot of the clinics were being run by people who hadn't so much trained as just got experience uh, from working. There was no formal qualification. Encouraged uh, study by clinical observation, started a great deal of research, case meetings at weekends um, at the RSM. The post-war formation of the, the, the NHS uh, led to a lot of debate about what specialties, what outpatients should be run by the NHS. And their Ministry of Health circular really formed the whole basis of the specialty of venereology. And uh, as you can see, 71 years ago, diagnosis and treatment of VD constitutes a separate clinical specialty and should not be left to become a minor interest in those of other fields. Now, I think that did two things. One, it created a separate specialty. And two, maybe it had an enduring impact to reducing the interest which general physicians, surgeons, particularly orthopedic surgeons, had for uh, sexually transmitted infections. So it's a double-edged sword once you start to create that sort of specialty. And that debate, which I, I know is, is, is very important today, about what should a general physician and the, the acute take and others be, be interested in doing, and where does venereology, or now, uh, as it became genitourinary medicine and then sexual health, uh, fit in. HIV, of course, transformed much of that liaison. The, the real interest that was also emerging at this time was how to promote good sexual health. But much of the way that the, the branding was done was to point to who brought bad sexual health. And this poster illustrates it perfectly. Here's a picture which was used to try and promote uh, uh, good sexual health uh, to the military in the 1950s. And there's no fun in VD. And it points to this sort of, you know, like a movie star, scarlet woman with a martini and a cigarette. All right? But he's pointing the finger at who's to blame. And in much, just as really with the Venereal Diseases Act and some of their ideas about enforced testing, particularly near military garrisons, they, there, was, there was a very, very um, um, stilted view and no real non-judgmental approach to holistic care of people coming forward for screening, testing or treatment. And that, I think, is something which we have seen change radically uh, in the last 30 years. That, that when, when some of us, particularly those sitting up here, first entered, maybe as students, uh, venereology clinics, there, were, there was still something of a, of, a, of a massive stigma. But through the changes, both in the way politicians began to speak about STIs and sexual health and HIV, and the way in which society viewed it, and the way that physicians in general viewed it, and I think uh, I, there has been a really important and, and seismic change in the role of managing in a non-judgmental, holistic, and equitable way uh, people uh, who have an STI or are at risk of an STI. Alwyn's going to talk about HIV and AIDS. I'm, I'm not going to try, try and dwell on this, but I really want to just emphasize how there were so many things about uh, the response in this country to HIV, not just by the College of Physicians, uh, by the specialty societies, but also uh, by uh, the politicians. And yes, the 80s were the worst of times, people uh, dying on inpatient wards of conditions that we hadn't seen before or couldn't diagnose and certainly uh, couldn't treat. The approach of trying to provide holistic care for people uh, dying of HIV AIDS at the same time as looking at research generated a whole, a whole generation of researchers, but funded through uh, remarkable uh, ways and partnership with both grant giving uh, uh, facilities and pharma. An alliance with government, and if you just need to, to look up Lord Fowler and the impact that he had as a, as a Tory grandee, somebody who stood up to Margaret Thatcher, insisted that funding for AIDS should be ring-fenced, and absolutely, along with partnerships with, with many people uh, in the medical professions and in the colleges and the BMA, stood up for having a new approach to this. A ring-fence funding, an AIDS Control Act, these were amazing things. 
And those that lived through the times and were fighting for them, I don't think um, appreciated at the time how different this was and how it hasn't really been recently until you know, changes in, in configurations and funding for stroke care, for example, that we've started to see similar approaches. And it took a long time for the NHS and Department of Health to learn that this was the way to begin to approach something in a very targeted and important way. There was great leadership uh, at that time. The impact was amazing. Again, I'm not going to try and step on Alwyn's toes, but you can see the remarkable uh, decrease in uh, deaths in HIV in the UK around the time that antiretroviral, combination antiretrovirals. I mean, it'll sound, you know, blooming obvious now that, you know, if you don't give, give one antiretroviral drug, you're going to develop resistance. Nobody would think of doing that nowadays to use merely one compound. But when we started putting three together, it was dramatic. And those, again, who saw people, you know, it was at the time in part described as, as you know, Lazarus syndrome, of people just getting up and walking. And it was remarkable. But it brought with it challenges. Because just because you could save people's lives from dying of AIDS, there was then the impact of the toxicity of treatment and the comorbidities. And much of those comorbidities also related to other sexually acquired infections. Now, where were we going at the time with a strategy? We've got a new 10-year plan out. It's got much in it, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention later where I think there are, there's real hope for, for the specialty of sexual health uh, and for the public improvement of sexual health. But in 2001, this was published. I doubt that any of you have got a copy. Um, it, was, uh, it had a, gr a very grand launch, and it set out a number of absolutely clear recommendations, which I can absolutely say have never been properly reviewed and have never been properly implemented. And yet, government was allowed by the people to completely change the nature of commissioning of sexual health to differentiate it from that for HIV, and to create a fragmented commissioning system, which has resulted in considerable amount of change and uh, inequity in the provision of sexual health care across the country. Clinicians have been trying to fight for this, trusts have been trying to fight for this, and many local authorities have been trying to fight for, for this, but this document sits there alone. It's not been reviewed, and it's in fact not referenced uh, in the 10-year plan. It was a great document. If you want to read a way a document should be writing a national strategy, this was it. However, as we often find, the desire to do something about a condition depends on individuals, and particularly uh, individuals like the leaders that Norman Fowler gave and others to this. And when others took charge, there was less impetus. There was also the issue that this brought real investment in sexual health services. People started getting out of the double basements, the temporary cabins, having really decent premises, and single-handed consultants were often finding that they were able to be part of a team. HIV had become treatable. Uh, there was an HIV inpatient tariff. There was MDT development. There was tremendous change, and, and there was funding. And government was persuaded through the strategic report, that there needed to be much more rapid access. The days of seeing people queuing to get into the STD clinic and being, I mean, there's, there's famous pictures of people being shouted at by men driving past in white vans about, we know where you're going, outside the, the clinic in Watford with a queue of 40 people in the rain. Those things have gone, and that has been remarkable. But sadly, the real, the real you know, impact of this has in part been lost. Now, partly that has been lost because HIV became treatable, because people weren't dying of AIDS, because STIs were treatable. Chlamydia, National Chlamydia Screening Programme, set up but never really fully implemented or the best made of it. Until we start to see an increase in STIs, I've been told there won't be new investment uh, in this area. Now, that's a terrible thing to hear in that you really need to start seeing morbidity and or mortality in order to there be renewed investment when you know that we can improve the public health. Complacency counts for some of this. We can look at other, other impacts on this, one of which might be that people feel that, that those who have sex and who have sex with multiple partners or under the, the, the influence of chems or alcohol uh, maybe don't need or deserve all of the care that they get from the NHS. Maybe that is an influence which has in time 
uh, been there, but I, I, I don't see it. But then I'm surrounded by other people working in sexual health. Whether you see that in your friends or in society or in other colleagues in the hospital, I'd be interested to know. But it's happened that there's also been complacency. And that complacency was beautifully put. America announced, I think it was in 1992, it was going to eradicate uh, syphilis uh, by, uh, by 1999. Uh, that didn't happen. Um, the, uh, uh, the complacency of gonorrhea, easily treatable in four hours. Well, sorry to show you a clinical picture, but this is back. Um, we're still uh, looking at gonorrhea resistance. You'll be aware about antimicrobial resistance in influencing uh, many uh, uh, septic patients that you're, you're managing and looking after or in any field that you're in. in. In our field, absolutely, gonococcal resistance is a major problem. The bugs have changed. We, we, we used to have penicillin. Right, we then lost penicillin, we then had quinolones for a bit, we lost quinolones, and we then moved on to a combination of things and cephalosporins, then we stuck in some macrolides in the cephalosporins, and we're now at the top end of that with, as recently reported, some uh, significantly resistant strains. How that's going to impact, how are we going to deal with that in a fragmented system? How are we going to deal with that where we're primarily using PCR to make diagnoses without culture? That is a real challenge. And with the lack of new antibiotics coming through into commercial use for us to treat, we are looking at the spectre of having to start admit, readmitting people uh, for uh, uh, IV treatments uh, for GC. That would certainly challenge the nature of confidentiality of sexual health. So what's happening? Well, PHE have kept on going, all right? They've kept on going, producing very good figures on the rates of STIs. This is mostly from those who attend clinics. We know that less than one in 20 uh, uh, young people who, who are diagnosed with, a, with an STI uh, in a clinic have attended before, and that's a really quite remarkable thing, that we're not getting the people in for screening, uh, and part of that is the reduced activity, particularly at weekends and evenings for young people. The increased syphilis, predominantly amongst men who have sex with men, and increased gonorrhea, uh, both in uh, men who have sex with men and uh, in, in, in heterosexuals, has greatly uh, dominated the, the airwaves. There's been calls to eliminate HIV, calls to eliminate Hep C. How are we going to square this up? Why aren't we trying to eliminate syphilis? Why aren't we trying to eliminate at least drug-resistant gonorrhea? Why don't we have a national plan? Why don't we have any national standard for the delivery of, of STI services? This is not good enough. It's not good enough at the political level. It's not good enough in the calls that the college are making. And it's certainly not good enough for those uh, individuals whose services have been tendered out and fragmented uh, within providing a less accessible service because of cutbacks to the uh, services uh, which have been commissioned through local authorities with a reduced public health grant. We need to stand up and be counted uh, on this item as the specialty societies are already. The other thing is you need to have some grand plans. And you need to look at your successes. Olwyn's going to talk about this, but I'll just put that slide up so it's indelibly imprinted on you. Let's look at warts. Genital warts. When I was first a trainee, genital warts, patients would queue up to be painted by the, 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 the trainees and the nurses with a brown paint on their warts once a week. This was bizarre. What were we doing? It's like, it's like the people who used to try and cut shankers out. It didn't, it didn't really work very well. It did if they came back about eight times, but who could, who could come back eight times for a paint with pedophilin? Well, we've really started to fix it, all right? The vaccination, Gardasil, uh, the multivalent one, Cervix was first implemented here. We first saw the first Cervix being given to, to uh, schoolgirls, uh, 12 and 13, uh, in 2008. Australia started in 2007. We're just going to do all boys um, later this year. Uh, we've been doing uh, uh, Men Have Sex With Men uh, um, for the last two years as part of a pilot program. But Australia's been doing that since uh, 2013. And the Australians... If you go to any meetings, sexual health meetings in Australia, they will say, and I'm going to show you this picture as an archive, by all means, by all means, use it and keep it in your antique collection, but the Australians will give a talk which says, the only warts we now see in Australia, after a decade of vaccination with a quadrivalent vaccine, is in British backpackers, all right? That's what they say, all right? And we sit there, mm, yeah, why has it taken us so long? The Scottish data came out very recently showing a massive reduction in cervical dysplasia. It, it, it is the, the vaccine works. Why we were so slow to implement it, given the data from the rest of the world, 
uh, is something which, which, which we really will need to be the subject of, 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 of an examination to make sure we don't make those mistakes again. But the data which has come shows that these, these vaccines uh, have made a remarkable reduction in warts, and hopefully we will be close to eradicating uh, genital HPV, just as the Australians appear to have. The other thing to say is what else have we achieved? Well, some of it's by, been by our efforts, and some of it's been by chance. Um, when I was first a trainee uh, at St. Mary's in the um, um, early 1980s, crabs were quite a common problem. We would see individuals who would come in um, scratching, um, hiding behind a newspaper, and you knew that they'd caught some crabs. Um, the current vogue uh, for shaving your pubic hair off has essentially deforested the natural habitat of crabs. And several papers have been written trying to explain the fact that this is now an endangered species. <laughs> now, that's good news, all right? I'd like to give you a stat like, you know, a, 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 si a pubic hair the size of whales has been, been removed, and therefore, where's the crab going to live? But what this makes is the point, and a serious point, that small changes in individual behaviour can completely change the prevalence of a condition, which is fascinating for how we are now trying to influence people's choices about behaviour. And in this case, shaving off pubic head, get rid of the crabs. But equally, there are many other things which people can amend and change, which will have an impact. I just want to finish on, on, on where we're going and, and take some blame, but also maybe some plaudits. At Chelsea and Westminster, uh, around our Dean Street Clinic, we, we pioneered a new service, basically a, 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 an express service, for, for individuals not to have to go into a clinic and see a clinician, take a history. It was all basically on a touch screen, and it was for asymptomatic individuals. And the individuals came in, they took their own swabs, they got a finger prick test done, and they got their bloods done, they got their results automated, texted to them. It had a remarkable effect. Um, it, it's, it, it's just over the road from the main clinic. In the main clinic, um, we were looking at something in the region of, um, of a 238 uh, days, uh, sorry, 238 hours uh, time for attendance to treatment, and then it reduced to 49 by the automation. Now, this was amazing. It's been followed by online services, a whole range of other things. The worry for the specialty is that even an asymptomatic patient who was defined as being at risk, who's come in, sometimes by seeing them, you could detect there was something else they wanted to say that may not have gone on the touch screen. Why, why are they in tears? Why are they nervous? Is it that they've been the victim of assault? Is there a domestic violence issue? Is there a safeguarding issue? Are they having issues uh, ar around uncertainty around their, their gender identity or their sexual orientation? What is it that they want to talk about which is okay and permissible in a sexual health clinic that they might not be able to do with others. These are things which, as we move towards automation, online testing, and trying to get at the heart of testing and treating people to eradicate, eliminate STIs, how we keep the specialty of medicine, which is much more than just about antibiotics and antivirals. So, in summary, there's been some, some really good glimmers of hope that we can carry on the fight that Mari Stopes, and Tommy Osmond, and, and others gave uh, to make the massive improvements uh, that the first part of the last century showed. There have been some very good NAIHR projects, such as the Lustrum project, looking at accelerated partner notification. There's been a whole wonderful piece of work around NatSAL, which you often see reported in the news about the sexual attitudes and lifestyle survey of what's, what's happening in the UK in terms of sex. There's been there is continued academic research. There are still some clinical trials looking at herpes vaccines, and there are still evaluations of the way in which we can best manage uh, uh, antibiotic resistance to gonorrhea. But if we do not join up in the way that the 10-year plan outlines, a way of making sure that those individuals who aren't going to a sexual health clinic get tested when they go into other medical facilities. If we don't keep the awareness of the way in which STIs can present everywhere from dermatology to urology to even neurology, all right? Those are the things that we have to explain. We have to keep in curriculums. It's not just about asymptomatic people having a test online or in a rapid clinic. It's still about medicine. 
and it's still about the need to make the public health and the individual health approach join up. Within the 10-year plan, there is a desire to bring together many parts of the healthcare and social care system, never more so, particularly around the use of chems, in the, in the issues that people are facing uh, in their lives with alcohol, to bring together drug and alcohol services, sexual health services and public health services affords us an immense opportunity. There has been a reduction in the number of trainees in our specialty and, and I, we understand that in terms of the, the excitement of managing HIV as inpatients and other things going away with the, 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 the blessed, uh, uh, fantastic improvements in HIV care. But there is work to be done and for those who want to continue improving the sexual health, it is vital that we do so. Thank you very much.